Um, so my name is Lindsay Harkis. I'm a clinical psychologist by training, and I'm the program manager of Emerson Street for, um, for teens and young adults. Hi, everybody. My name is Rebecca Witheridge. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, um, and I'm the assistant program manager at Emerson Street. And we will provide our contact information and website on our last slide, but I just want to give a brief overview that Emerson Street is a program through Mental Health Center of Denver that's been open for about five years, and we serve youth 15 to 26 years old and provide a variety of services, including prevention level programming, clinical services, supported education, and supported employment. Awesome. And so we're gonna be focusing on young adult mental health today, which is um, aptly timed with everything going on right now in society. Um, and we're gonna be covering, you know, this is a short talk about 20 to 30 minutes and we really wanna give time for questions at the end. So we have a couple of things we're gonna go over and some suggestions on how to support youth right now. Um, and so we'll kind of get going with the slides. So here we are, we're in 2020. And as we all know, it's been quite a doozy of a year. Um, as you can see here, we've identified a number of challenges that are facing young adults and teens um, right now, as well as the rest of us. And a lot of these are stemming from the current pandemic that we find ourselves in, um, the current events that are going on in our society. And all of these things really impact one another and overlap. Um, in fact, it's kind of hard to tease them apart. Um, and they sort of have a compounding um, influence on each other. So, um, Lindsay, do you want to talk a little bit about surge capacity and how that sort of plays in? Yeah, I was listening to, I kind of have a, a crush on Brene Brown and her podcast. She was speaking about a recent article that addresses what's called surge capacity, which is basically what researchers and emergency responders notice when we're experiencing a natural disaster or um, in places of war that we have this ability to respond and survive during crises. But what we tend to notice is after about six months, we start to really find that burnout and kind of a power down in that surge capacity. And so we're right around six months in this pandemic. And she used a metaphor that was like, it's like being in the middle of a hurricane and trying to clean up from the hurricane at the same time. So we're really navigating a lot of things right now. Um, and I thought that was really interesting and well-timed for this talk today. Absolutely. So you know, we're going to, there's a number of things on this slide, and we're just going to kind of touch on a couple of them. Um, the first one that really comes to mind when we're thinking about teens and young adults is um, the current lack of independence that is happening. Um, as we know, right, teens and young adults, part of their whole developmental trajectory right now is trying to become more independent, trying to step out on their own into the world um, and exhibit more of that independence, differentiating from their family of origin. Um, and a lot of that has really been limited by the pandemic right now. Um, folks not being able to be out and about. Um, a lot of folks are being stuck at home. Um, and in some cases that might mean a family home that's pretty small. And some of our teens and young adults might not even have their own room. Um, and so that means they don't even have their own space. So um, that coupled with the fact that you know, many community spaces that they might otherwise engage with, like public libraries, for instance, are also closed. So um, that's really limited folks' ability to kind of strike out on their own, um, not to mention the social isolation that comes along with that and, and wanting to be independent and going out with their friends. Um, but really what that leads me to think more about is school and work. Um, so there's been a lot of school disruption for teens and young adults right now. If we think back to last semester, right, a lot of um, you know, high school seniors who were supposed to be graduating in the spring didn't get to have their graduation ceremony, didn't get to have prom, didn't get to have a lot of those sort of, um, I'd say really meaningful kind of milestone events in their education that young people are often looking forward to. And so that's kind of left folks with this feeling of, you know, there've been a horse racing for the barn and it's like the barn's shut. It's like, where do I go next? Um, even, even for folks now, in, you know, in this fall semester, thinking about college students who, um, you know, maybe folks who have spent their whole life getting ready to go to college and now it's all online. So I'm not going to class. I'm not getting to interact with my professors like I thought I might. Um, I'm not getting to spend time with my, my peers who I was so excited to, to make friends with. So um, that's been a pretty big impact on folks. Um, and then thinking about unemployment, right? Everybody is experiencing higher unemployment right now, including young adults. 
um, losing their jobs or having trouble getting a job because of the competitiveness. And I've also heard young people say, you know what? I don't know if I even want to get a job right now because I might have a, a grandparent at home and I don't want to inadvertently expose that person to COVID or, you know, whatever else might be the case. So, um, you know, these school work pieces really do fold back into that independence piece and um, the limitations that teens and young adults are experiencing right now. Absolutely. And as Rebecca said, you know, well, we could talk on just this slide, honestly, for 20 to 30 minutes and just how much each overlap, but grief and loss is something that's huge. I mean, Rebecca spoke about several things with grief and loss in terms of lack of graduation ceremonies and those big um, life events, but also grief and loss from death loss. Um, youth we're working with having grandparents pass away and then how that impacts being able to attend a funeral or memorial. Um, and that certainly those concerns, um, as Rebecca mentioned, with health concerns. So maybe not wanting to go back to work, fear of contracting the illness and, or maybe spreading it um, to someone in their lives. And social media and news inundation is something that I've been really thinking quite a bit about because with change in routines, you know, folks aren't traditionally going into school right now or going into the workplace as much. And so more time is being spent on social media or absorbing the news. And we're not built to process grief and loss and um, kind of a lot of the news on a global scale or a national scale, we're just not built for that. So being kind of inundated with that information constantly can have significant impacts on mental health. Um, not to mention just the changes in routine and impact on things like sleep with more screen time and things like that. Um, you know, it's still early in terms of looking at statistics and research on increasing mental health concerns and suicidality, but, you know, initial um, indicators are showing that uh, mental health, substance use, um, suicidality has increased with the pandemic, and in particular for groups like young people, people of color, um, essential workers, and as you can imagine, some of those categories sometimes can overlap, and we have youth that are in all of those categories, and so are struggling, and noticing increases with depression or anxiety, um, maybe suicidal ideation. So those are some important ones that we wanted to highlight on this slide, but um, as I mentioned, we really could spend 20 minutes just here. Absolutely. Well, take a good look. Um, we'll take a moment here to talk, uh, you know, add some words, some language that's directly from the young people that we're working with, kind of expressing the challenges that they've faced this year. Um, for example, here we've got a high school student who says, doing all the senior year stuff from home is hard. I'm even doubting going to college at all, because if it's like online high school, it won't be worth it. I'm disappointed that prom and spring graduation are canceled. I told my family I wouldn't want them to go to my graduation anyway, because I don't want to risk them getting coronavirus. Thanks, Rebecca. I have another quote here, and this is from one of our young folks that we're working with through our Urban Peak Partnership. They said, I feel so shut in. They kick us out of the shelter in the morning and we have no place to go. There's no place that's open to us right now. And then lastly here, we've got a quote from a college student who just started college. Um, I really lack motivation. Online school feels like a waste of my time because I'm really not learning anything. It's so much easier to slack off on the work and look up stuff online. I'm disappointed and ashamed that I can't focus. I was so excited to start college and now I don't even know what to think. So these are some of the, uh, the experiences of the young people. And um, you know we can sit with that for a moment, but part of this presentation is about what we can do about it and how we can help. Yeah, so you know, when thinking about, obviously there's a lot of diversity in each young person that you might be kind of approaching or trying to support, but we wanted to give some tips or some things to think about when interacting with youth and um, ways to kind of just open the questions and things like that. So you know, one thing is I think it's really important to be authentic and validating right now. This is hard. And I, I know a lot of the adults, you know, certainly my coworkers, the people in my life that are um, adults, we're all struggling right now. And so I think to try to move past that and just focus on positives and not kind of sit in the validation of difficult feelings sometimes can feel really minimizing. And I think it's important for youth to, to hear from us like this is really challenging right now and very unique. And so in so honoring that experience. 
rather than trying to move past that because it's uncomfortable. Absolutely. And um, for lack of a better term, I would say teens and young adults have really good BS meters and they're going to notice if we're not being authentic and if we aren't telling it to them straight. And so um, that's a really important piece of our role. Um, And, you know, relatedly here, Lindsay just mentioned this, but this piece about not trying to fix overwhelmed emotions and really asking what it is that young people need and how you can support. Like she said, you know, it can be a sign of our own discomfort. Sometimes we, we want to rush to action. We want to make things better. And I think that's coming from a place of, of, you know, wanting to help. Um, but we really do need to make space for those feelings and those emotions first before we, um, rush in. So super important. Um, and also because we might not we might think we know the answer and it might be different, right? The, the young person in our lives might be able to show us a better path to helping them than we might've even thought of ourselves. Yeah, everyone needs something different. And so we really can't know unless you ask. And just like the grief we were mentioning earlier, I think, you know, you can't fix a lot of, you know, grief and the emotions. I think creating that space is so important. Um, flexibility is huge. And I think this can come up in a lot of different types of ways, but I think, you know, right now there's just so much in flux um, with our society and the things that are going on. And so being able to be flexible and maybe not so rigid on the routines or things that were established prior. And we're going to talk a little bit more about routines in a minute, but flexibility is super important right now. I mean, think about it. We, b- before uh, March, I guess we, we telehealth was not a thing that we offered at the mental health center of Denver. Right. right? I mean, a little bit, I think we had one person who was doing it and literally in like 48 hours, we transitioned so that we are all providing telehealth services. So that's just one way that MHCD has tried to be flexible in the way that we serve people. But I think um, that that concept is broader than just that, but thinking about ways of helping, you know, modes of helping and just also just general mindset there. Um, So, you know, relatedly, um, we've got a a piece on here about leveraging positive connections and technology, Um, you know, Social media is a thing, FaceTiming, phone calls. I even think about online video games for some young people, that's a way that they connect with the the folks in their lives. And frankly, I think to myself, probably once every other week, it's really lucky that we're not in the Spanish flu times in 1918 when we didn't have these ways of connecting with each other um, because there'd be a lot more social isolation than we currently have. And frankly, TikTok has made me, has laughed me through many a a dark day um, during this pandemic. So, um, you know, there are some tools that we have at our disposal um, that we can encourage positive, you know, use of for our young people and for ourselves to connect with each other, to connect with young people and positive adults in their lives. Um, so that's, that's a great option that we have. Absolutely. And I definitely agree with that. And Rebecca and I kind of go back and forth and tease each other sometimes because I'm also a big proponent to take breaks sometimes from social media and the news and things like that, because I also think we can get sort of, um, bombarded a lot and it's hard to kind of filter on a social media news feed, you know, what you might want to read and that's positive connecting with people and what might be um, news or things that are a lot to process. And so, you know, encouraging that self-care and taking breaks. And I think knowing that one day you might set up a video chat with someone and then that day you might be on the computer all day and decide that that's really not what you're needing. And so advocating for that self-care and um, setting boundaries, I think is really important also. And we'll take more time to talk about this later, but um, when we think about um, self-care, I just had a conversation with a young person last week in which I asked her, hey, you know, what are some things you can do for self-care? What's something you do that always makes you feel better? And she honestly answered smoking marijuana. That's one of her go-to coping mechanisms. And I said, okay, well, let's dig into that a little bit. What are some other things that you might be able to do to, um, that makes you feel good? And eventually we got to exercise as something that she also finds uh, meaningful and enjoyable. And um, by the end, she committed to, you know, taking some more walks a week and, and things like that. But I think, right, you know, self-care and, and those coping skills that we have, sometimes those can be healthy, healthy coping skills, and sometimes they might not be as healthy. Um, right. So modeling what is a good healthy coping skill is super important. Um, Lindsay, do you want anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think, you know, some folks might have heard this metaphor of the oxygen mask, you know, when you're flying on a plane and the oxygen mask comes down, they say to put the mask on yourself first. Um, 
because if we're not taking good care of ourselves, it's we can't take care of someone else. And so not only is modeling important, even if you think, you know, the young person in my life is not paying attention. And if I do it, they're not going to want to. Um, you'd be surprised actually how much folks are picking up on and how much folks learn about coping through the people in their lives. So taking good care of yourself, if nothing else, so you can really show up in a beneficial way. Um, and that might include too, getting your own supports, right? Whether that's your support system or through therapy, and so just really wanting to um, encourage that also. I think it's really easy to kind of focus on young people, but we also really need to focus on taking care of ourselves. Absolutely. All right. Take it away, Lindsay. All right. Um, so making small manageable goals, I think, you know, sometimes, and I've even noticed this for myself, it's like, where do I start sometimes when there's so many different things going on or so many different changes in our world? And so I think supporting young people and having small manageable goals, and as Rebecca was mentioning earlier, that sort of loss of independence in a lot of ways can be so impactful. And so maybe that's asking a question, like, what are the goals that are maybe small and achievable that I can help support you in? Um, but helping them identify those, I think is important. Yeah, and I think too about practical and tangible goals, you know, for helping with tasks, you know, helping a person, helping the young person, you know, submit that job application, help them complete the FAFSA, you know, the, the tasks that are kind of those adulting type things that maybe young people have never done before. So they're not familiar with how to do it. Um, I have heard some young people express frustration that especially now that they're doing online school connections to people like their coaches or their guidance counselors, those, those supports that are built into their school environment that they would normally go to for help with some of those things are lacking. That's partly why we offer um, education and employment support at Emerson, but um, you know, being in a supportive adult in someone's life to help them kind of take, take on some of those tasks and um, normalize the fact that it's okay. They don't know how to do it yet. They've never done it. <laughs> They've never done it before. Mm -hmm. um, this next part here, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but giving the young people around you permission to not operate on all cylinders, if you will, you know, nothing is feeling particularly normal right now. And when things aren't normal, you know, it takes more energy than normal to just kind of get up every day and, and do the tasks that you need to do. So reminding folks, it's okay if they need a little more time, if they, you know, aren't feeling at their at a hundred percent, um, and that it's okay to be on the struggle bus. Uh, we're all there with them. Um, one example of this that I think is cool that even um, the College Board is recognizing that young people are not operating on all cylinders is that for this next fall, the ACT and SAT aren't going to be required on college applications. Um, so. People can still take them and submit those scores, but, you know, even our kind of standardized educational system right now is recognizing, you know what, you know, we can't hold our, our young adults and our youth to the same expectations that we might otherwise, because this is a, we're in bizarro world. So we got to do the best we can. So. Yeah, um, instilling hope, humor, and focus on gratitude. So it's, you know, it can be, uh, with everything going on, it can be really easy to start to feel a little hopeless or to kind of lose track of kind of those next steps or things that we're excited about. And so I think really being intentional about focusing on what things we're grateful for, what are the silver linings of the pandemic, um, of a lot of the social movements happening right now, um, interjecting humor and hope, I think is so important. So we really wanted to add this on. Um, we talked a little about maintaining or recreating routines and spaces. Again, you know, teens and young adults are just, first of all, learning how to do that for themselves right now anyway, and it can be a challenge to begin with. But now when it's like, oh, I've got an online class and it's at, you know, noon, but like, I don't actually have to go anywhere. So maybe I'll just stay in bed all day and I won't get up until three o'clock, you know, and then I'll stay up until three o'clock a.m. You know, it, it makes it a lot harder for folks to have that kind of, um, the containment that they that they usually look for or have around them. So helping young adults to figure out what are some small ways I can have um, routine in my life. If it's making sure I eat breakfast, if it's making sure I take a shower every other day, if it's you know whatever the case may be, those small um, markers can really help. Yes, structure is very important to kind of maintain some semblance of normal, and um, as you mentioned, sleep hygiene, all those things, and you know, um, figuring out private spaces in the home, even with everyone working from home and going to school, like that's a new discussion that had to happen prior. 
um, links to supports and services. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're really initial numbers and stats are looking at increase in mental health concerns and substance use and suicidal ideation since the pandemic um, has started. And so looking at what are the supports um, outside of just the way we support young people that we can get youth connected with? So that might be mental health services and kind of seeking that support. Um, I did include here our Colorado Crisis Services website also, which has the text line and the call line, uh, which is 24 hours as well. Um, and I, I mentioned this earlier, but that also might be um, supportive ser services for caregivers and parents. And um, I think also, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, I want to remind too that the crisis line for caregivers and adults, sometimes they're not the one in crisis, but they can call to get support from other professionals on talking them through. And so I really wanna encourage adults to call that they don't have to feel like they are personally in crisis to get that support that they're needing also. Absolutely. Um, our last point on here is, you know, don't assume that your young person is doing well if they don't appear to be struggling and to make sure to check in regularly. Um, you know, some youth are more quiet and reserved than others are maybe better at hiding it if they're not doing well, they might not vocalize how much they're struggling. And in addition, I was just thinking today about, you know, sometimes when you're struggling, it doesn't show up as a conscious thought in your head. It might be that you're feeling more tired, feeling more run down. You might be getting more headaches. You might be getting stomach aches all those types of sort of somatic symptoms that can appear. Um, and so if you're noticing those, that might be an indication that um, a young person is struggling as well, because maybe they can't quite, you know, it's not to the conscious level maybe yet. Um, so just keeping that in mind and, and making sure to keep checking in, even if it seems like things are kind of running smoothly. Yeah. I've heard from a lot of youth and folks in my life, just the sort of roller coaster effect where it's like some weeks I'm doing well and some weeks not so much. And so, that's another reason to check in regularly. You know, someone could be feeling better one week and really be struggling another. Um, I'm wondering, Rebecca, I'm looking at time. I'm wondering yes. if we actually transition to the Q&A. Yeah, point. we can do that. Um, I'll just pull, throw this up here real quick before we do that in a sentence here. Youth are resilient and adaptable and they are um, finding ways to manage during this really challenging time. I think the quote in the middle here that says, I don't have to be 100%, I just need to do what I can to make it through each day is really kind of like the cherry on top of, um, yes, like it's hard right now, but we're figuring it out. And maybe there are some positives too, getting to engage in services through telehealth or whatever the case may be. So, um, so just know that despite all these things, you know, it can get better. <laughs> We really want to give an opportunity for folks to ask questions um, about the topic area or if there's anything that we mentioned earlier that you all just want to follow up on or have a comment on. I haven't seen any questions come in. So just as a reminder, feel free to put your question either in the chat or use the raise hand feature of Zoom and we'll let you speak. While we're pausing, I just wanna highlight with our um, stay in touch slide here. If anyone does have a question later that maybe isn't coming up or they just kind of wanna connect about what services we're offering through Emerson Street at Mental Health Center of Denver, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. We also have our website. We recently got on Instagram, which we're really excited about. Particularly Could not be more Street. stoked. <laughs> yeah, really, really excited. And so, um, this conversation doesn't have to end here, and we really do want to encourage folks to reach out if they feel more comfortable afterwards or have any follow-up. Okay, are youth wanting to connect by text or telehealth? Um, so we, you know, technology, we feel very, very grateful that we work with an age group that um, does a really good job with technology already. So when we had to really rapidly pivot to telehealth, 
it went really smoothly. In fact, our engagement is up in a lot of areas of our programming because you know, youth are really liking to connect via technology. I'd say the exception is groups. They really miss that in-person connection in groups. Um, do you want me to so, speak to group kits? Please, yeah. So one thing we've tried to do um, to make the, the telehealth component of groups a little bit more engaging for folks is when folks are signed up for groups at Emerson Street, um, we have both a couple clinical groups that we offer as well as some prevention level groups, which means they're really just... Um, uh, a place for, for folks to get together and, and do a fun activity and engage with their peers. Um, so for those, we've been producing group kits. So our staff are putting together some tangible um, packets with like activity materials in them um, and ingredients for like cooking groups, which happen once a week. And those are being delivered to young people's homes so that when they are engaged in our virtual um, telehealth groups, there's still some tangible practical component. So they don't feel like they're just staring at the screen all day. Um, so that's been helping a little bit, but um, I would agree with Lindsay that I think our, our engagement has been surprisingly good with telehealth. For some people, they prefer it. Um, but the one area that is, you know, tough for everyone is, is lacking those groups. And we've done a couple in-person groups, social distanced, but we're really trying to be responsible about that and um, do the vast majority of our services through telehealth. And those are obviously outdoors also. And so with the weather, right, either being really hot or as we're approaching winter, that's a little bit more challenging. So we're always trying to get creative. Thanks for your question, Jeannie. Okay, well, it doesn't seem like there are other questions right now, but again, really encourage you all to get in touch if um, you have any questions after we meet today or just wanna connect about our programming. Um, and just a reminder, if you'd like to support our program, you can donate um, at the website included or to the side um, in your chat. And I think Sarah, you had a few things that you were gonna say at the end. Yeah, thanks Lindsay and Rebecca. We appreciate your time today and the information. And thanks to everybody else for joining us today, both for the main program and for this breakout conversation. As a reminder, if you haven't had a chance yet, it's not too late to be a part of our work and mission by making your gift using the form to the right. Uh, we also encourage you to check out our Wellbeing Live events. Uh, it's a, a regular series. And you could go to our website, www.mhcd.org and scroll down and there's a whole section about well-being live um, and you'll find more information about our programs and how to improve your well-being. A recording of today's program and each breakout session will be available on our Gifts of Hope page soon um, and make sure you also sign up below to be the first to know details about the second event in this Gifts of Hope series which will be coming in spring of 2021. So thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.